Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody coming to, uh, I think this is night three of uh, our software testing fundamentals course. Um, so far we've gone over uh, what we what we think a QA is, software development lifecycle, and testing types, almost all the testing types. Um, wanted to check in with everybody. Is there questions? Are there things that maybe you think we should have? There, there's, are there questions that you have that we haven't answered yet that maybe um, you know, should have been answered in the early parts of this? What do you think? Anybody have uh, anything to share? No, everybody's everybody's on board and caught up with everything we're doing so far. All right then, let's uh, let's hit uh, black box versus white box testing. So, um, I'm gonna let you all, if you haven't already, read read the definitions of black box testing and white box testing, and then going to uh, try to summarize them real quick. So I'll give you about uh, a minute. Show of hands when everybody's done reading the this the screen. Everybody else done reading? All right, well, I'm gonna assume everybody's gotten through reading that. Um, I'm gonna boil these down into a little bit shorter, maybe a little clearer. Black, black box testing, basically, we, um, sorry, don't know if you can hear the noise in the background. Um, let me go back. So black box testing. Simply put, it's the tester knows the inputs and they know what needs to be the output. So we're testing that I input A, it comes out as A. When I input B, it comes out as B. Making sure that everything works but we know nothing about all the switches all the changes in between uh when we put our input in and we hit enter and what comes out at the end we know nothing about that um a nice example would be a, a math app where we put in you know two values seven and three we know we should expect to get 10 out we don't know what the code is behind it we don't care we just want to make sure we get 10 out that's that's black box testing in a nutshell white box testing white box testing to me is the testing the developers do in their unit testing where they know every one of the switches in the code and you make a unit test so that it so that it hits every switch in the code. Um, and, and you know the data structures and you know 
how that data is going to be stored. So one of the things about white box testing is you might have a file that say, let's take a financial app for instance. Um, I use Quicken. Quicken has the ability where you can bring down all your financial transactions from your bank and it puts them into the, the balance sheet or, or sheet that you're seeing on the screen. So then you can clear them and you know what went through. Okay, so if I'm over at Quicken and I'm testing this, I know that I have this file and I know what's in that file from a bank, from a other financial institution. And I know that when I say uh, import this file, it's got to go into the database and it's got to put pieces in the right places in the database. So in that case, we can actually do white box testing where we look at the database and maybe do a database command and a SQL command and pull the information out of the database and say, did it actually put it in the right place? We don't have to look at the the UI to decide. We look at the Quicken's internal database to make sure that it's, it's seeing things correct. That makes sense on differences between black box and white box. Okay. Steve, I, I have a question for you. So like, um... How does this like come into play like in practical terms? Sure. So again, I think in, in I'll put it into two different camps. When you're doing um, internal testing, there might be times. I, well, I back up. You're going to. You're going to ebb and flow between back black box and white box during the time you work at different companies. It depends on what you're doing and what and what type of application you're working on. A lot of times, in my mind, we want to take the black box approach. We want to be able to say, we have a requirement. The requirement says this goes in, this goes out. We don't care about what else happens in between. So we take the black the black box approach. Other times, if you're in, if you've got an application that's doing some kind of import or some kind of some kind of piece that maybe never actually gets to your UI, if you've got pieces like that, now you have to go into the white box testing. the The answer to um, pass or fail might lie in I did an SQL query to my database to make sure that it got in there because it never actually goes to the screen in its form during app, uh, after the import. So you got to make sure that the database is set up correctly so that then another process in your in your project can take that data and do the computations on it to determine something. Joe, does that help do you think that's the way it, it it comes in and out yep absolutely yeah i just that's the point i i was hoping that um uh, you would cover and i knew you were going to nail it but um but basically yeah it's not like you do one or the other and like that's all you do it's like yeah you may have to do white box testing sometimes you may have to do black box testing sometimes and then there's various different tools that could help you uh, accomplish both kinds um so but yeah that that's that's exactly what i was going for thanks steve woohoo i passed the test from the boss <laughs> <laughs> all right well i mean and that and that goes back to probably something that we should have uh said along the way um and sim Audrey, i'll get to you in just a second but if you look at all these different testing types you're going to ebb and flow between all of them at some point in your career. At some point in your career, you're going to be looking for doing strictly functional testing. At other points, you might be doing regression testing. Um, I've been in teams that were specifically, 
Um, we were the system test team. We we never looked at the actual. We never looked at components functionality. We looked at the system as a whole and made sure that the system worked from end to end, not just that you know my hello world came back with hello world. All right, Sam Hadri, what's you had a question? Yeah. Uh, the thing is, you are the key players when it comes to black box testing and uh, white box white box testing. I mean, the the participants or the technical guys who are who are the main persons who are involved in both the scenarios. Um, I think as that... far as I understood, one, one second, sir. As far as I understood, uh, the white box testing involves the internal guys. And the black box, it can be even the external people who, I mean, the end user also can be involved in that. Am I correct in that? Um, can you please clarify further? Sure. I guess when, when we're talking about quality assurance, um, we want to make sure everything is, is working correctly before we get to the end user. Of course, the end users are going to be using the using the product end users are going to have only black box testing they're never going to really understand or know all the internal workings of it um but as a qa engineer like uh, joe and i were just saying you're gonna you're gonna flow back and forth between doing both of these at multiple times that help yeah, and also I would just to add to that, like I would say like black box testing is more common like when you have like a third party development team because you don't necessarily have access to the code. They're just providing it to you and then you're just doing black box testing. Um yeah, so that's where I've seen it a lot and um uh, I had another point I was going to make, but I forgot. Maybe it'll come to me. All right. All right. So I think we've now finished and completed testing types. Um, hopefully, everybody has has that down. If there's any questions, uh, let me or Joe know. I think next, um, what we're going to go into is testing stages. And the first time around when we gave this course, we talked about testing stages versus testing types, and it got a little bit confusing. But um, what I'm tr what we're trying to do here is to expose you to different terms and different things you're going to hear at the companies that you might be joining, or the you know uh, wherever you might be joining to do QA. You're going to hear hear about testing types. You're going to hear about functional testing. But you're also going to hear about functional testing stages, and maybe not as much as you would in the past, because uh, a lot of these were terms in the past. But I want everybody to understand that there is um, the functional stages as well. So the the functional testing stages. This is when we go into uh, what unit testing is. So unit tests are typically written by the developers um, and they're written while they're developing their code. They make it so that they hit every switch. They hopefully hit every piece of the component they're writing and we can tell before it gets built and integrated into the rest of the system that their pieces of code do what they were supposed to, that we don't have any anomalies there. A lot of times, people will get um, in organizations that are just starting out, you know, that are looking for how to do QA and, and they'll want the QA team to do unit testing for them. And that's, that's something that just, it it's difficult, if not impossible to happen. And so I say that because I've always tried to give everybody the understanding, working with dev managers and developers that, the only people who really know enough about the code to do unit testing is the development team. 
QA can help them and we can we can help them figure out what needs to be tested and what pieces need to be done in that unit test. But typically we don't get involved in the unit tests. Okay. Then there's smoke testing. Smoke testing is where we are checking the basic functionality of the system so that we know that the new build that we have is ready for additional test phases. So these, these tests should be no more than, I don't know, I'd say three to five minutes. A, a group of tests that within three to five minutes, maybe at the most 10, can tell you if this build is ready. These should be integrated into your DevOps procedures. Uh, so you can do CICD, uh, that's continuous integration, continuous development, where the, develop, the developers or the DevOps builds the code. When it, the code is built, it automatically runs these smoke tests. These smoke tests then tell us if it's ready to go on. If it's not, it kicks the build back to the developer, and the developer can look and figure out what happened, fix it, and put the build back in. So these things should be going on all day and with every build so that you know that when you get a build for you know the daily build or the weekly build everything in there is ready to go and we can continue to do additional testing so then this is where it gets a little bit confusing functional so functional testing functional testing in the stage is in the next stage is that we are validating the requirements or the user stories or the functionality as it was defined so that we can make sure that in this current iteration every story that we had or every requirement that we were asked to get out is working correctly as designed so functional testing does not go back and do it doesn't go back and do all the different testing that we did from previous sprints we're focused so if on this sprint for instance they built the code to accept a credit card in the in the acceptance of payment then that's what we're focused on does accepting a credit card work we don't care about anything else about the card about how everything else works we're focused solely on that functional testing now you might in focusing on that piece, find issues in other areas, which are ancillary bugs, which are great, but we're focused on that piece. So we report all the bugs we find, but we we're, our focus is if this piece works. So this is, I, I, I pause on this because this is one of the critical parts of making sure that we're always moving forward with our with our quality of our product because the quality of the product is only as good as the last sprint or the last iteration that we've we've completed okay so moving on then integration testing integration testing helps determine whether all the modules that we have work together as designed. So back in the functional testing, you're working on accepting a credit card number, accepting knowing that you know the credit card numbers only begin in a certain four-digit code, and depending on that four-digit code, they're either American Express, MasterCard, Visa. Um, or whatever else you have. But th that first four digit code kind of tells you what they're using. And that helps you de determine if this is a valid, if this is a valid code. Um, integration testing, we're making sure that not only did we enter that, whatever it is, 16 digits, 12 digits for a code for your credit card, but we were able to go out to the credit card company and get authorization that says, yes, that person can use that credit card and yes, it, it has that much credit on it. 
that's that's an example for me of integration testing. System testing. On system testing, we're looking at the end-to-end -end testing of the product. So um, I use this example in other areas, but you, so Amazon, you have a product that you want to buy. So the end-to-end -end test is I get logged into Amazon, I go search for that product. Does it actually find the product that I was searching for? Then does it let me select that product? Does it let me add that product to my cart? Do I? Does it take me to the cart? Let me check out now. Does it allow me to put in my payment options? Uh, do we validate those payment options? And then do we uh, return that your order, your item was ordered and it'll be sent to you in X number of days? That's, that's an end-to-end -end system type test. Then um, next is regression testing. Regression testing is simply, these are the tests that you ran two sprints ago, five sprints ago. This is your test repository that you've taken a set of those tests, not every one of them, but you've taken a set of those tests that you know um, they, they, that they test the most breadth of your product and can be used every time you go to, every time you're getting ready to go out. So in most companies, you will do, you'll have a development environment. That development environment is strictly developers. They do all their dev and unit testing there. When they're ready, they build it and they move it on to QA, the QA environment. The QA environment then becomes, we do all our testing. We know the functionality works. We know it works fairly well and is ready for integration, system testing, and maybe even regression testing. So we put that from, from there into an integration environment or a, or a, you know, whatever, lots of different names people use for it, but it's an integration environment. It's, it's the environment that's right before production. In this environment, you wanted to, you, with regression tests, you want to automate them as much as possible. Regression tests should be automated tests that can go through and build your confidence that whatever's in your integration environment is ready to go to prod. So as you're building functional tests or integration tests or even system tests, your automation team or your automation part of your group should be building those into regression tests for the next, for this re regression series or the next. But once you do regression testing, then um, you're ready for going to maybe the final test that you have, which is acceptance testing. And in a lot of places, regression testing and acceptance testing are kind of combined. But acceptance testing is basically, we give this to the users and the users say, are, is this working as designed or is it or is it not? In some places, I've seen the integration environment be strictly regression testing. When we're ready and we're comfortable with it, we turn it on to prod, we move it to, the prod environment, the users now have access to it. And there's a, a testing period. Maybe we, we do the develop or we do the, the promotion to prod on a Friday. And there's some people who are going to test it over the weekend. That's the acceptance test to make sure that if they say it's good, then on Monday, we turn it on for everybody else. Seeing that happen as well. The last piece of the of the functional testing stage is ad hoc testing. And this is exploratory testing. You've heard it both ways. It's basically taking a set of a, a time marked set of tests and just going out and 
working on an area say you know we've had problems in okay we're, we're amazon we've had problems in our cart area our cart's not working 100 percent like we wanted to we take five ten people we even maybe take the whole qa environment and we say we're going to do ad hoc exploratory testing for the next hour i want you just to go out and do things in the cart and make the cart make the cart work hard and everybody's working in the cart and oh by the way this will help stress test it but we're getting strictly working on the cart functionality At the end of that hour now we take that list of bugs that we found issues we found we we co collate them and we send them off to dev and say look this is things that we found that might be affecting why the cart is acting wonky for some some users that helps now if we want to and we get done with the hour and somebody says you know i think we could spend another 15 minutes working on the cart can we do that if everybody agrees we spend another 15 minutes working on the cart that's the example of ad hoc exploratory testing all right so everybody have an idea what functional test stages are okay we're going to mark that one complete and we're going to go down to non-functional test stages so non-functional test stages another way to think of functional testing is we're doing everything about requirements everything about functionality in non-functional testing stages, this is where we talk about performance testing, security testing, and user acceptance. So performance testing validates the performance of the system. It's, it's as simple as that. There's subsets to it. You can talk about load testing. Can, you know How many users can be on this system before it slows down or goes belly up? How many people can be gaming on my network before they before they make it so that I can't do my my job? Um, stress testing. This is actually putting stress on the machine, not not just users, but stressing the system and having lots of different processes going on, lots of different processing going on at the same time. So this is where stress testing, you might have hundreds of processes in the cart at Amazon. You might have hundreds of processes doing search features. You might have hundreds of processes doing um, purchasing items. So this is, this is just simply, we're trying to get the app to a point where it's hit its limit and then find out when it hits its limit plus one, well, what does it do? Does it does it go belly up and everything stops, or does it put the that plus one on hold and finish with what it's got and makes room for the plus one and is able to queue things up the way it needs to? So to me, that's stress testing. Endurance testing. Um, we've done we've done this before at places I've been at. Um, this is where somebody says you know um, we have a peak we have a peak limit to how many um how many people can use the product but we know that we can we can go to peak and stay at peak for for you know 48 hours so let's let's run a test let's go to peak put as much as we can on the system run that for 48 hours and what happens does it does it survive it if that's our contract with our user that you know we ought to be able to continue for 48 hours well then that's it um we've proven it but a lot of times what we'll find out is that it'll be an ever never ending endurance they want it to be able to run at peak for uh you know eternity so that's that's when we go and say okay let's run an endurance test and run it for you know a week Typically, one of the things that you'll find people doing is they'll take and for an endurance test, they'll run 
twice what it was supposed to be able to do and run that for like a week and if you can run it twice the the highest level for a week then you can give some uh some ability to feel that you can uh do all the do it for a long time um scalability testing scalability and spike testing well scalability first is how do how do we scale can we if we have 15 users on the system and we add 15 users every five minutes um for the next 10 hours can we do that okay or do we all of a sudden crash we did this uh my one of my old jobs we basically put our testing in j meter and we ran it so that every five minutes we added a we added five more users to the process um when we first started doing that scalability testing we were able to get to uh, about 30 users before we we crashed the system by the time we worked with dev for about uh two sprints we had it up to over 200 users so yes this is a example in scalability spike testing is taking the limits of the system and and going straight to that limit so instead of just easing our way to 100 users, we could say, spike the system, 100 users just, just all logged in, what happens? So that's performance test, the different performance testings. Anybody have questions there? I have a question for the group. Um, is anybody interested in like learning more about performance testing like how to actually do performance testing the madre is interested okay landon ari swati okay cool maybe this um, is a place we can add some some value at some point joe yeah that's what i'm thinking because um, it's not something that a lot of uh, a lot of QAs or QEs know, but I think it like um, it's a nice skill to have in your in your toolbox. Um, so yeah, I'd like to see us maybe build something out at some point. All right, thank you. Yeah, and I agree that most of the time, performance testers that you meet, they've they've been doing performance testing for a long time they're they're very specialized in what they do but as you move up and you become a a lead a test lead or um a test lead is when you probably need to know how to do you you might not do performance testing but you need to know how it's done and what needs to be done in different scenarios test architects uh definitely you know in my role as a test manager or senior test manager you have to have an understanding of of performance testing to be able to to know when to bring the performance guys in and when's the best time to run those performance tests all right so let's move on to security testing security testing is things like uh, penetration testing uh, this is when I'm a malicious actor and I'm from the dark web and I want to try to log into your system. What happens? How, how does the system act? How does the system act when I'm just sending, I'm spamming your system constantly and hitting your, your interfaces? Can it handle that? Can it shut that, that, uh, malicious actor out so that they can continue working with the good people or does it crash because they the penetration weighed through or maybe the the vulnerability of just having a uh, mass media attack has caused a problem um 
fuzz testing. This was an interesting term when I read it and when I tried to uh, get a little bit deeper in it. But to me, fuzz testing is basically instead of having something specific, what happens when you when you can put in partial usernames or or maybe you can put in partial information into an API and the API all of a sudden gives you access to things it shouldn't. That's fuzz testing in my, uh, in my book. Uh, risk assessments. So this is uh, looking at, at different risks of the system and, and making an assessment. You know, if you're using accounting data, can, can somebody get in to the back door and get to the accounting data to get to the database and find something out? If you've got a system that maybe has five different companies that are putting data into it, you don't want somebody from company A to be able to see what company B put in, vice versa. So you got to have that risk assessment testing. Now, again, this is a, this is a pretty uh, specialized form of testing. Uh, you'll probably hear a lot of places will call it infosec testing. Um, so that's security testing. User acceptance testing or usability testing. This is another specialized testing that's done at the end of the process, but you really want to have people engaged throughout the process. So the user acceptance testing that I've that I've gone through is it basically giving the client or the end user the chance to run tests, scripted tests that you've written to make sure that the functionality they asked for is what they got. So this is where you say, um, okay, user, your the end-to-end -end test for this is A, B, C, D, E, and F. Let's we write that out into a spreadsheet. We go out and we do user acceptance testing. All the users do A, B, C, D, E, and F. Well, one of the users says, wait, Steve, when in this special case, I'm going to do A, B, C, D, F, and then E because I do them in the, that order. Now we've found out there's a different way to do this. And does the system still work doing it in that order versus doing it in a, the order that we all thought it would have? So that's some of the examples or an example of user acceptance testing. How are we doing, guys? Are we pretty clear on uh, what non-functional testing is? Go ahead, Sim Harder. Actually, the thing is, uh, you were saying that the five different companies are uh, sending the data in, right? So yep. what happens? if the chances of these five companies without knowing about each other they send in the same data yep. i mean that is that is some so when you have a when you have an application that handles data from multiple companies mm -hmm. uh for instance you're doing you're doing <laughs> you're doing the ir you're, you're doing the um the IRS work for five different companies, or you're doing the accounting work for five different companies. When people from company A are sending stuff in, you know, we want them all to be cordoned off in their own area. And we don't want an accident to happen. So those are things that we that we try to, those are test cases that we try to do in those different considerations. We try to be in company A and put a bunch of data in and then be in company B and try to see if we can't somehow make sure we can't see company A's data. Make sure those firewalls are up that keep us from seeing things we weren't supposed to see. Okay. Right. Thank you. Say that again, Samadri? Yeah. Got it. Thank you. All right. Um, anybody 
else? Questions on functional, non-functional testing? We've got about 15 minutes left. Um, we can stop here before we go into test. I, I think if we try to if we try to go into the requirements document and test planning piece, we're going to be part way through and hit the and hit the time. So, Joe, do you think uh, this is a good stopping point for now? Yeah, I think it's a good stopping point. I think um, we can open up the uh, the floor if anybody has any topics or any questions that they want to talk about aside from the training. Like if they want to pick our brain about anything or talk about anything, like we can uh, we can hang out until the time's up. But but yeah, I think for training that's good. Okay. Yeah, I put the requirements document in here because I thought we might be able to do it, but you know I didn't know how long it'd take the other two pieces. So. Um, let's stop here. Um, next session, we will definitely go through requirements training. The other pieces that we will go through, uh, we'll go. So we'll go through the requirements document of test planning. We'll start talking about test strategy and test plan. We may get to the test. There's a test planning summary, and then we've got a sections on a section on. Uh, requirements versus test scenarios versus test cases and we can basically uh, play that video um, or we can have everybody play that video at the end but uh, I think we should be able to make it through test planning in one in one session so that will be next Monday is that right Joe yeah all right well so does anybody have anything or you know, me and Joe will hang out, and if you have questions, we'll try to answer them. Go ahead, Landon. Go ahead, Landon. Uh, yeah, so sorry for on the previous page, the security testing. Um, is that usually like a different subset of QA or whether you're usually like just uh, put in that position and that's all you're doing or is that something that is usually, like you said, with the performance testing, uh, there's usually like separate performance testers, or uh, is that is that basically the same? In my experience, both secu so security testing is its own area, and performance testing is its own area, um, and it's different groups that that work with you during requirements, but then come in at the end and do their testing. So you'll usually get separate reports from a security test team um, and from the performance testing. Joe, is it typical for you or do you see that being like all in one testing organization? Yeah, so um, in my experience, I guess Rocket Mortgage is probably the best experience I have. And it was similar to your experience, Steve, where we had a separate performance testing team, uh, Team Impact, they were called. Then we had a separate uh, security testing team. Security testing team could also be called like penetration testing team or pen test team. Uh, they basically all mean the same thing. They do security testing. But what happened at Rocket is that um, our team was moving so fast and those other teams, the security team and the performance team, um, they were like a shared resource. So like we had to plan out our engagements with them very far in advance. And it was kind of hard to like get it right a lot of the time. So what we ended up doing was like a lot of um, like team internal performance testing, not so much the security testing, but um, performance testing. Yes. Um, just because it was hard to get a hold of the performance testing guys. Yep, it was a shared resource in my in my environments too, and it's it's basically you had to kind of guess with the product team. Okay, I'm gonna have a full feature product on X date, and so I need to have you know the the performance team available during that time 
and then they'd mark their calendars to be ready and you'd come up and go uh i'm gonna be two weeks late and everything would blow up and you'd go oh damn <laughs> <laughs> exactly yep does that help landon i mean one of the things that i will say is i have lots of friends who do performance testing and i get in meetings with them and i kind of like pitch the ball out there in sports in, in a sports metaphor and i let them do the, the the heavy hitting and i just like okay here's what we need done and they take care of it they'll tell me you know they'll go into all the performance metrics and different things and i'm just saying okay <laughs> awesome yeah i appreciate the answers guys um and yeah i think what for as far as security testing is that what kind of like trainings or tools do you i mean obviously i don't know anything about that but because is is that a something like how with performance testing like i know i know about like docker um a little bit but like with security testing could you recommend any types of tools to look into to to maybe learn some more information on that let me talk to one of my co-managers that i worked with back and i will yeah this is one but i'll see if there's any other infosec type tools that he recommends that we could uh, give out as examples Okay, awesome. I appreciate it. Burp Suite is another one. Okay, any other questions? And Joe, why don't we uh, why don't we end the presentation or end the recording, and but we'll hang out and answer questions for the next ten minutes if anybody has them. Sure. <laughs>